Bet this football season with my bookie. Use promo code Gators and get a 50% match with your first deposit. Only at my bookie. Gators Breakdown. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters, and you can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Here we are, Vanderbilt, the next opponent for the Gators, as the Gators will travel to Nashville to play the Commodores at noon on ESPN Saturday. So we'll have a really good preview here from Chad Bishop, senior editor of athletic communications at Vanderbilt University. He'll join us here on Gators Breakdown, giving us a really good preview of these Vanderbilt Commodores. Winless team, but they are playing better uh, the last few weeks. Probably still overmatched uh, a good bit by this Gators team, but we'll give you a preview of who to look out for and and what to expect from Vanderbilt uh, a bit on Saturday. Before we get there, remember you can find Gators Breakdown on news4jacks.com slash Gators Breakdown. You'll find all the Gators Breakdown episodes and News 4 Jacks coverage of the Gators. Please share, rate, and review the show. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. We're almost at 5,000 subscribers. Be the next one. Be the 5,000. We'll see. I know it's really close right now. But look, all those likes, all those subscribes, it really helps us out here on Gators Breakdown. Or if you just want the -the on-the-go podcast version, check us out on your favorite podcast platform, Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, all that good stuff. However you can find us, we are out there ready to go. Follow Gators Breakdown on social media or on Twitter and Facebook at Gators Breakdown. Chad Bishop, Senior Editor of Athletic Communications at Vanderbilt University, joining us here again on Gators Breakdown. Chad, I hope uh, I hope 2020 is treating you well up there in Nashville. Yeah, about as, about as well as it could, right? I mean, it's been a, been a struggle for almost everyone, but uh, just taking it day by day, just like everyone else up here in Music City. At least we got some football this year. Hey, I'm telling you what, um, you know, for all the, the wins and losses or injuries, I mean, if your team is playing football games, I think you should be thankful as a fan because I know there's a lot of schools out there who who decided to forego it and a lot of schools who have had to cancel or postpone games. So every Saturday when I'm at the football field, you know, I'm thanking my lucky stars because we all love the game of college football and it, it's great to see some of these kids get some opportunities. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's move on to this Vanderbilt team. And you see, look, it's been a rough season, of course, for Vanderbilt going winless so far, but you can see the team getting better as the season progresses. There is no doubt. I don't think there's any question. And I think what what's really positive about that aspect is, you know, look, looking at Vanderbilt's schedule, had a real tough game against LSU, real tough game against South Carolina, uh, took it on the chin against Ole Miss. You know, and at that point at 0-4, things could have really went south. But instead, you know, they went down to Starkville and played Mississippi State and, um, you know, really had control of that game. And if not for five turnovers, uh, possibly could have came out of Starkville with a win, but uh, but lost 24-17. to And then last week at Kentucky, um, you know, got down in a 14-0 hole early on, uh, but stayed with it, kept in it, got down 17 twice in the second half. Uh, came back and and got that to within a field goal game with 30 seconds to go. So definitely the silver lining here is this team has not folded despite being winless. They have a bunch of young playmakers on offense that have continued to prove under first-year offensive coordinator Todd Fitch. Uh, And they've kind of treaded water with a defense that's lost a lot of guys to injury and a lot of guys to, to covid quarantine so um they're they're hanging with it you know they're not losing hope and not losing sight and they continue to to practice every day and go out there and try to win football games and i think that's a testament to the character of the team because obviously uh, like you said being winless this late in the year it could be real easy for them just to kind of to throw in the towel and yeah i would get i I would think you have to give some credit there to to Derek mason and and, 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 you know this team still playing for him or or still playing for each other but you know there's as you said they're still out there playing Last couple of seasons, you know, there's been a whole lot of talk of uh, of Derek Mason's job status there at Vanderbilt. We've already seen South Carolina make a move uh, with Will Muschamp this week within the division. So that's one change uh, already down uh, here, clearly close to these programs. Is this something Vanderbilt will assess after the season, or you know, because of this crazy year and in, in season, is is it you know pretty much a conclusion that we'll see Mason on the sidelines again for Vanderbilt next season? 
Yeah, I, I think it's definitely something, you know, Candace Story Lee, the athletic director has already been on record as saying, you know, she will evaluate Derek Mason at the end of the season like she does with every coach at the end of their respective seasons. I, I think there's going to be a lot of factors at play here and, um, you know, certainly never making excuses for Vanderbilt and Derek Mason wouldn't want me to, but COVID is definitely a factor. Uh, you look at this team that was supposed to open the year against Mercer, an FCS team at home. And so you just imagine what would that have game been like and how much confidence that would have gave this team. Uh, they brought in a new offensive coordinator, but didn't really have a spring uh, or a full summer to really implement those systems. And uh, they got virtually an entirely new offensive line, a true freshman starting at quarterback. And so you just kind of wonder, you know, how would have a full season shaped out if they would have had some non-conference games that maybe they could have uh, worked on some things or, or collected some wins and, and really changed the scope of the season. Um, you know, the other factor is Vanderbilt, you know, has a new chancellor in Daniel Deermeyer, and uh, he is he's on record as saying he's going to be very invested in athletics. Uh, I know for a fact that he's, um, you know, very involved in the athletic process and, and, and wants to really make the future of Vanderbilt athletics very bright. Um, so I think all you have to kind of look at all those factors when you, you speak of Derek Mason and where the future of the program is going and, you know, whether they're going to give him some facility upgrades, whether they're going to, you know, chalk up the season as just being kind of a anomaly and, and kind of weird in, in the sense of how many players have been available and how many games there were. Um, so I, I think time will tell. I, I don't I you know, I would be shocked if there'd be any sort of you know, change or decisions made during the regular season. I, I think that's something they'll probably sit down in December and, and discuss and, and figure out which, which way they want to go. Yeah. I think the recent play and, you know, the, the, the and if they can continue, I guess the upper twin uh, upward trend, and I don't know if how record would necessarily uh, look after that, but I, I think if we've seen the improvement we have the last couple of weeks, uh, there, I think you know Mason probably probably uh, will be on the sideline uh, again next year. And and another reason for optimism here, Chad, is look, quarterback Ken Seals here. You know he's he's come along nicely uh, the last couple games, and the true freshman is kind of you know learning trial by fire. But it seems to be paying off right now. He's played really really well. And again, we we talked about the Vanderbilt team kind of as a whole, uh, not throwing in the towel and and not giving up on a winless season. I think the same can be said for Ken Seals. I mean he. He's had his struggles. He's had some red zone turnovers, which have been very critical. Um, he's 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 learned the tough lesson, like you said, of he's an SEC quarterback now, and no one's going to feel sorry for him. And he's taking some hits and taking some licks, uh, but he's really starting to command the offense and be a leader. In fact, this past week, wide receiver Chris Pierce, who's a veteran on the team, said uh, he's not sure how Ken Seals is doing it because he remembers his time as a freshman and kind of how lost he was. Uh, and he kind of marveled at Seals' ability to be calm, never get too high, never get too low, and really direct this offense. And uh, I think week by week you're seeing him improve and gain confidence. You're seeing him understand Todd Fitch's offense a little bit more. Uh, he's spreading the ball around to not only his wide receivers, but his tight ends and his running backs. Uh, and he's only played six games, and he, he's putting up some big-time numbers. Um, he's probably going to end up with the most passing yards in a single season for a Vanderbilt freshman quarterback uh, so he's got a tremendously bright future and that's why they brought him in I mean he's a kid that you know went to every single football camp in the world grew up in the football rich state of Texas um, and is really bred to be a big time quarterback and he's showing early on he's, he's got the tools to make that happen now, one thing they've shown, you know, they're not afraid to throw the ball down the field and use his big old and use his big arm there. I mean, I think that's, you know, probably if, if I'm looking and assessing him for, for the future, you know, it's, uh, you know, they're, they're not afraid to throw the ball down the field. It may or may not connect, but you, you see, you see within the offense that that's part of the offense is pushing the ball down the field. Yeah, when you watch Vanderbilt's offense on Saturday, you'll notice it's there. There will be a lot of short passes, you know, kind of out to the side, left, right, to try to make the you know defense move sideline to sideline, some short, you know, slant routes. But um, they'll keep the defense honest, like you said, going on that home run ball. You know, last week at Kentucky, hit Chris Pierce on a big thirty-four yard bomb. Um, so it was, uh, it's, it, that has developed, like I said, the offense, you know, started off very slowly this year and as time has gone by and they've understood, you know, who can go make that deep, deep ball catch, uh, and that Ken Seals is able to connect on those. They started to do it a little bit more and that's, that's just helped the offense as a whole. It's helped in the run game. Derek Mason spoke this past week about how play action has gotten a lot, lot better in the past few weeks. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's, you'll, you'll see Vanderbilt throw it you know, very, very short most of the time, but um, they're now not afraid to take those shots downfield and they're starting to connect on those more often. 
And you, you've mentioned his name a couple of times here, but wide receiver Chris Pierce Jr., but also another skilled player, running back uh, Keon Henry Brooks. It really seems like the offense is mostly f- focusing uh, or flowing through those two guys. Yeah, no doubt. And and we spoke kind of about uh, injuries and, and COVID protocols, uh, and that's affected the offense just as much as the defense. But, um, you know, Keon Henry Brooks has really, you know, emerged as that go-to bell cow at running back even though Vanderbilt was supposed to have a three-headed uh, monster back there this year with J.B. on Marlowe and Jamari Wakefield, but Marlowe has gone through a little bit of a suspension issue and Wakefield has been banged up a little bit. And now Keon Henry Brooks last week at Kentucky took a shot to the rib, so he's been kind of limited in practice this week. Um, Derek Mason expects him to go, but he's been tenderized, so to speak. <laughs> uh, but that, that running game has, has been very good and kind of unexpectedly when you lose Keyshawn Vaughn down there to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, that, that running game has been very good with kind of a makeshift offensive line. And then, you know, Chris Pierce has really stood out in terms of the deep passing game. Cam Johnson's really the number one threat at wide receiver who can make catches short, medium, and long. And then Ben, ben Bresnahan at tight end has been outstanding. He's You're going to see him make some really tough catch, catches across the middle, especially on third down. And he's a very good blocking tight end as well. So, yeah, I mean, the, the playmakers are there, and that's Todd Fitch's offense. He wants to spread the ball around. He wants to get it in a bunch of people's hands. Uh, and so if we could just kind of envision a Vanderbilt offense with every single playmaker available, I think they'd be that much better. But, you know, injuries and, and some COVID things have kind of limited their numbers, and still uh, they've been able to kind of make strides and make progress as the year has gone on. Chaz, okay, we move to the other side of the ball. I mean, the, the, the plan has to be for this defense is, is find some way to sl- at least slow the game down. You may not – Slow the Florida offense down, but you got to slow the offense and you know, maybe 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 play some a, a little more preventive of a preventive defense there if you can limit big plays from this Florida passing game and, and force Florida to run the ball. Going to be a hard task there, but what have you seen from this Vanderbilt defense that you know maybe in some spots can hold up for a little while? Yeah, that's that's you're right. I mean, it's going to be an extremely difficult task, and and that's kind of been. Um, you know, the issue with, with Vanderbilt really as a whole is one week the defense may play well and the offense may turn it over five times. The next week the Vanderbilt offense may play very well and the defense kind of ha- has a tough game. That's really kind of what happened last week in Kentucky. They they couldn't stop that big play. Um, Kentucky had a 74-yard touchdown run. They hit a couple big passes in the first half. Just way too many big plays from that Vanderbilt defense and that can't happen against you know, Florida offense, which is, you know, liable to put up 60 points if they can on Saturday. So you're right. I think you're exactly right. They have to keep the ball in between the 20s. They have to understand that, hey, Kyle Trask and company are going to get some yards. They're going to move the ball a little bit, but buckle down um, and and really step up in the red zone. And and that's actually what you saw Vanderbilt do in that Mississippi State game. They kind of allowed the Bulldogs to to move a little bit in between the 20s. And then in the second half made some big time adjustments for defensive coordinator Ted Roof and really stymied Mississippi State so uh, they kind of have to you know I think come in with a similar game plan of understanding hey Kyle Trask and his weapons and and the and the Florida offense they're going to make some plays and they're probably going to score a little bit of points um, but you got to limit as much as you can and try to keep you know your offense in the game and give them a chance and, and maybe you know win a game in the 30s if you can. Chad, uh, last thought here, and you know, Florida had their bout w- with COVID and, and, and having to go through all the protocols and missing games, and Vanderbilt has as well. Uh, kind of what's the status uh, of the program after all that, and, and how how are you know, coaches and players and even yourself around the program, how's everybody holding up there? Very well. Uh, you know, I th- it's, it's interesting. I think, you know, if you look back, Vanderbilt, if I'm not mistaken, was one of, if not the first, to have a game postponed because of COVID. And then the dominoes started to fall on everybody around the country and around the league is, is kind of dealt with it as all. It seems like the worst wave, you know, knock on wood, is behind the Commodores. Week by week, they've they've gotten players back. Guys have started to trickle back into the system and gotten out of quarantine. And, you know, it's not so much positive cases. It's just uh, ensuring, you know, guys who have come in close contact with maybe someone who has, has tested positive that they're staying safe. And, um, you know, Vanderbilt's numbers have been, you know, in the low 60s and the high 50s the last few weeks. Uh, but they've continued to kind of slowly trend up to get a lot more guys back and a lot more guys available to play. But, um, you know, Vanderbilt is, you know, kind of at the forefront of keeping uh, their kids safe, you know, with the hospital being on campus and the technology and the resources they have. And they've done, 
really a, a tremendous job of making sure that this thing doesn't really, you know, kind of derail the season or, or derail their student athletes and keep them them as safe as possible. So they, they seem to be in good shape going this week. You know, as we as we record this and talk about this, I haven't heard any major major issues with the team. So let's hope it stays that way and they can finish out this season healthy. Absolutely, absolutely. So good good luck there. Uh, as uh, I know, you, you guys got hit hard, about like Florida did uh, a few weeks ago. So hopefully, hopefully all is, is good there. Like you said, and continues to be in that way. So Chad Bishop, senior editor of athletic communications at Vanderbilt University, thank you so much for joining us once again on Gators Breakdown and previewing these Commodores for us. David, thank you so much. Appreciate it. As we record this, the Gators are 30 and a half point favorites over Vanderbilt. And you can get some skin in on the game with my bookie, where odds boost, lightning deals, and free bets await all season long. And with Turkey Day right around the corner, there really is no better time to feast on some NFL action. Whether you're a first time customer or have been playing with my bookie for years, there is no shortage of value to be found in the thousands of game lines unique prop bets, and the contest they offer every week. Sign up or get reloaded today. Find an edge, make your bet, and get paid. They also boast a fully-fledged casino platform, giving you access to all the classic table, slot, and card games you'd expect to find at your local spot. And the best part is, at MyBookie, the doors never close, so you can continue to build your bankroll even after the games are over. Make the right play and sign up at MyBookie. And when you do, use promo code GATERS to get your deposit matched halfway all the way up to $1,000. Terms are simple. Say you put in $200, they'll match you with another $100 in your account. If you were already planning to bet this season, this is free betting money. It's winning season with promo code GATERS only at MyBookie. Here we go. Looking, heard the conversation there. Vanderbilt offense, you know, has found its footing a bit the last three games, averaging 435 yards of total offense. In the first three contests, they only averaged 256.7 yards per game. And as we just talked about quarterback Kenny Seals, he's shown marked improvements from the first two games from the last four. Completion percentages, first two games, 57.4. The last four games, 70.4. 13% jump there for seals and completion percentage passing yards. He had 263 total in the first two games since then the last four games, 1,028. So passing yards per game in the first two games was 131 and a half yards up to 257 uh, a game uh, in the last four games. So definitely showing the improvement there. His passing efficiency, his first two games, 95.73 in the last four games, 139 and a half. So, there we go. Marked improvement there for Seals, the true freshman quarterback. Uh, sophomore running back, uh, Keon Henry Brooks, you heard us talk about him as well. Catches the ball out of the backfield, too. He's totaled 215 yards on 22 catches this fall. Fourth in the conference in all-purpose yards per game. Another playmaker here for this Vanderbilt offense, senior wide receiver Chris Pierce Jr. has caught a touchdown pass in three straight games for Vanderbilt, becoming the first Commodore to accomplish defeat since – Kalaja Lipscomb against Tennessee in 2017, then Middle Tennessee State in 2018, and then Nevada uh, again in 2018. So better competition here for, for Pierce in the all SEC schedule, uh, but catching in three consecutive games uh, there. So that was, uh, Lipscomb was split, uh, of course, over a couple seasons. Uh, Pierce Jr. had two career touchdown catches entering the stretch after totaling three receptions for 29 yards in the first three games of the season. Pierce Jr. has recorded 13 grabs for 175 yards and three touchdowns in the last three games for Vanderbilt. So there's a guy that, that to look out for. Chris Pierce Jr., wide receiver for Vanderbilt, has come on a good bit in the last few games. And Commodores overall, at least uh, one passing touchdown in all six games this season. Um, first time since the final seven games for them since 2018. Uh, so there we go. Uh, Vanderbilt threw three touchdowns against Kentucky. After uh, that, I mean, this was last week. Vanderbilt threw three passing touchdowns last week versus Kentucky. After ten, uh, after Kentucky had not allowed a touchdown, a, a passing touchdown score since October third. Mississippi State, Tennessee, Missouri, and Georgia were all held without passing scores against Kentucky until Vanderbilt did it last week. So, as we said, this is an offense that will take their shots down the field. 
they play short a lot, but they like taking their shots. So uh, lately, the sales gunslinger man- mentality of being there from Texas. But look, all that doesn't translate right now for for the true freshman led offense here. 100th in total offense, 116th in scoring offense, 111th in yards per play. You know, while it has been better recently, still not all that great of an offense. They struggle running the ball, uh, but they keep with it. And they'll do that (laughs) versus Florida to slow the game down. They have 229 rushing attempts on the season compared to 203 passing attempts. So they're running the ball a bit more, but it's not amounting to much. They're the 101st ranked rushing offense in the country, and they're running the ball more than they're passing the ball. So, as I said, Seals has got the big arm. They'll try and test it. Look, as much as they run the ball, you heard Chad say it. They'll go play action a good bit as much as they run the ball. They tried to hit their explosives through that style uh, of play here. But big, big arm. It'd be interesting to see how you know this Florida pass rush uh, makes them pay as they try to take their shots. You know, if they're going to run some play action, if they're going to rely on play action. This play take time to develop. So can the Florida defensive line, linebackers, get back there to seals, create a whole lot of pressure, create a whole lot of sacks. As we know, Florida leads the SEC in sacks right now. They know they can't keep up with Florida, but uh, they'll pick their spots, uh, especially given where uh, we see the explosives are an issue for the skater defense right now. I don't think the Commodores will score much early in the game, but they, uh, they'll they put their points up when the game's out of reach. Other side of the ball – Man, get your popcorn ready, Gator fans. <laughs> Vanderbilt, 86 in total defense, surrendering 443 yards per game, 98th in scoring defense, giving up about 36 points a game, 84th in the country, giving up 185 yards rushing, and 88th in the country, giving up 257 yards passing per game. They won't really pressure Trask all that much if the trend of this season continues as the Commodores are 104th in the country with only 1.3 sacks a game and 115th in college football with only 3.8 tackles loss per game, tackles for loss per game. They don't do any way, anything well on defense too much. <laughs> Their secondary only has one interception on the season, and in the last three games versus Ole Miss, Mississippi State, and Kentucky, those three teams combined to hit 82% of their passes. 82% of the passes the last three games this Vanderbilt defense has given up. So uh, credit to uh, College Football News for that stat. But I saw that one. I was like, oh, man, you're going against Kyle Trask in the last three games. You've given up 82% of throws. Whew, man, it'll be a field day. A field day early on. The plan, pass early and often, run late. And often, <laughs> so you know, unless Mullen wants to work on some stuff with Emory in the second half, uh, we'll probably see a little bit slower game in the second half than we will in the first half. And look, during the first half, Vanderbilt has yielded 984 yards to stand 12th in the SEC. Opposing quarterbacks have a 172.35 rating during the first half of games versus Vanderbilt. The Commodores are fourth in the league in fewest rushing yards allowed in the opening half with 417. Teams are throwing early on Vanderbilt. Second half has been a different story. As Vanderbilt has yielded 694 yards and nine runs of 20, more, uh, 20, or, uh, 20 or more yards. Vanderbilt's pass defense has given up the second fewest yards in the league after halftime with 563. With Trask numbers in the first half of this season, especially in the second cu- uh, quarter, uh oh, Vanderbilt. <laughs> Chas is going to have a big day. He's going to have it early. Yeah, but uh, this could be a day for the Florida run game to break through as well. Um, you know, they're consistent. They're fine, but can get better in one aspect. You guys have, you know, hurt, hurt, hear, hear me say it. Uh, explosive runs. You know, Florida has played six games. Malik Davis's 23 yarder is the longest run from running backs all season. Trask has the second longest run with a 26 yarder behind Tony's 50-yarder. That's still one area of improvement we can see. It's, it is nitpicking. There's nothing wrong with this Florida offense too much, yeah, if, but if you want to look at one little area, that's where I'll go with it. And look, it's there. It'll probably happen this game. You know, it may not happen at the start versus Vanderbilt, uh, but I think Vanderbilt will play this game pretty safe. Uh, they'll try and slow it down. Not a lot of big plays, but I think this Florida – Offense will still kind of just start picking their way uh, through this Vanderbilt defense. So I look for Trask to have a whole lot of yards uh, early on in the first half, pick them apart, break them apart. And then you probably and, and look. I, I think um, the DBs for for Vander 
for Vanderbilt. Maybe the linebackers will drop back a whole lot early as well. So you may not get the big runs early either. Uh, as you know, the, you'll get past the first, much like Arkansas last week, you'll get past that initial line, the the the, the box for with these running backs. But then they'll come up and make a tackle. But then make them. Maybe we'll see the running backs make a move or so, or break some tackles, even more tackles down the field, and we'll see these explosive runs uh, start to happen a bit more against an overmatched team like Vanderbilt. All that said, all that said, 57 to 20 is the final score that I have. I think the Gators are going to put up a whole lot of points. Once again, definitely see it. I just don't see much in the way of this Vanderbilt defense. <laughs> yeah, they can stop Florida uh, from scoring a whole, whole, whole lot of points here. There. So I think uh, a lot of you guys agree with me. I'm going to read some tweets, of course, as we do in most of these preview episodes, I'm trying to get your guys' thoughts on here. And I want you to get creative with this one because I think uh, most people want to see the same thing against an overmatched opponent. So I was trying to have some fun uh, with this one. So Jonathan at Notorious Gator says, can we see a block punt, at least an attempt, at a block or a kickoff return for a touchdown. Yeah, I can see, you know, wanting the special teams to get uh, more involved. Uh, I remember Florida last week versus Arkansas came after a punt that uh, we haven't really seen all, all too much. You could tell from pre-snap that Florida was coming after the punt. They got close uh, there. But, you know, if there's one thing I think a lot of people were so excited for when Dan Mullen come in uh, from Mississippi State and kind of looking back at Urban Meyer, it was like, hey, the special teams might be back. You might have a lot of speed on the field. You might have some starters out there on pump block and, you know, trying to get back there and block some punts. Hasn't necessarily translated. We haven't necessarily really seen all that 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 much. Uh, so yeah, here we go. You know, maybe this is a game you can go try that kind of stuff, and then maybe you know get some get some a uh, cheap score early on as well uh, through special teams. Uh, it's rich at R F Steiger. Hope I'm saying all that right here. He says dominant de- defense from start to finish without giving up any big plays. Let's see, Music City Magic. Donald Lipscomb, Donald Lipscomb says Kyle's Heisman campaign to continue until the first half, then tinker time to get ready for the rest of the season. Get specific here. Hopper gets with the ones more snaps for Jalen Lee extended look at EJ running the full offense Lingard hitting explosives. So a lot of this would be getting into your bag uh, late in the game, but I do agree. Get, get, get some more of those linebackers out there. Go back and listen to the Gator panel. Um, that we had this week, too, as one aspect of this defense. We still don't necessarily get a whole lot of why you have a more true linebacker and hopper playing less than Bernie and Diabate, who struggle at playing at linebacker. And no fault to me if they're on, they're not linebackers. They're they're not pure linebackers, more in the mold of uh, what hopper is. So you know, maybe we see, uh, don't get me wrong, Diabate and Bernie are playing better, but they just still get eat up by opposing offensive lines way too much. Um, so maybe Hopper can come along and, and earn some more playing time here. Snaps for Jalen Lee. Yeah, I think, you know, as the season moves forward, I still want to see the interior of the defensive line get a little, some get some more proven guys out there who, who can hold up. Uh, in, in, in competition uh, that's coming up there. We can still see Florida get better. And you don't want any you know injury for, for Campbell or Slayton or, or Dexter to kind of slow you down. So maybe you know, Jalen Lee, some other young defensive tackles, get some more uh, playing time here. Extended look for EJ running the full offense. I completely expect to see that in the second half, a whole lot of Emory Jones running this Gator offense. And hopefully we do see Lorenzo Lingard hitting some explosive. The other running backs as well. But this is a game where you can go get some Iverson commit and some Lorenzo Lingard even more carries. Um, you know, well, I think we'll see a whole heavy dose of the three main running backs early on in the game. But it's time to get those younger guys. Look, they're, they're not, there's not going to be many opportunities when we when we went back to look at the season, the preseason, hey, look, you got 10 SEC games. There may not be as many opportunities to go let the the roster loose. This is one of those games. So you go you go take advantage. And you, it was advantage last week as well. You got some young guys, some playing time. You got some playing time a couple of weeks ago against Missouri as well. So young guys are starting to get more playing time. You're starting to see that. We'll see it more versus Vanderbilt. And you probably – I think somewhere along the way, I think you'll have a close game with the games left on the schedule with Tennessee, Kentucky, or LSU. But I also think one of those games is going to be another blowout along the way for the skater team, the way they're scoring points. So 
games are coming up where you're going to start seeing a lot of these young guys, and that's why watch these games. It's, it should be fun. We, I mean, look, a lot of us want to see some of those younger guys anyway, but this is the game where you're going to see it. And a lot of those younger guys are going to be out there on the field. A lot of those freshmen and redshirt freshmen and sophomores that we just haven't seen a whole lot of, you know, maybe Braun and Ethan White on the offensive line, probably be more playing time for them too. Some of it because they're injuries right there. So you, you're going to see those guys anyway, but you're going to get to see them extended, an extended amount of time. So it should be really exciting to see a lot of these young players uh, that we're going to see for years to come get some playing time this week. Uh, John Man, um, Mancuso, Mancuso, hopefully I'm saying that right, John. Sorry if I'm not. He goes, a shutout just to quiet the fire Grantham people. So <laughs> there we go. Look, I don't know how much you'll learn from this Gator defense uh, by pitching a shutout, but you know we don't give credit enough for doing what you're supposed to do. And I don't know, look, I, if shutting out Vanderbilt, I don't know how that's going to translate when you play Alabama in a couple weeks, but at least go do your job. At least go do what you're supposed to do, and you get credit for that. There's, there's not enough credit sometimes given for doing your job and doing what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to blow Vanderbilt out. Go do it. You, you you got to do it. You got to start showing steps on defense, and that would be a step. Now, as I said, I don't know how that translates in a few weeks when you go play Alabama, but at least put some confidence in the team, put some confidence in the fan base a little bit uh, with a dominant de- defensive performance, build on it, and then go the rest of the season by getting better each game. And that's what would be an example. Uh, an example of that would be pitching a shutout versus an overmatched Vanderbilt team. Triangle Gator gets really creative here. Really, really, really creative. First play, shotgun set with Trash taking the snap. AR in the backfield with him. EJ set out right. Trash hands off to AR and leaks out. AR backwards pass to EJ. EJ hits Trash for a 75 yard touchdown. Trash does the Heisman pose in the end zone. <laughs> so, Kyle Trash Heisman moment right there. He gets a pass for 75 yards and does the Heisman pose. But, uh, you know, you can see that. But instead of AR, maybe Tony. You know, <laughs> we'll see where that goes. But uh, plenty of options to run that play there. But that would be that would be cool to see. That would be nice to see something like that. But nah, I, I, I'm good without Trask having to. Uh, look, I told you guys to get creative. I'm glad you're having fun with it. You know, we, we get to have some fun here uh, talking football a bit. But I don't think I want Kyle Trask running a 75 yard touchdown route. So you know, keep him in the pocket, keep him protected, and get him off the field when Florida's up by 35 to nothing at some point in this game. Uh, Brandon from PSL says defensive lineup experimentation kind of spoke with that too. You know, Jalen leaves was mentioned about getting some more playing time, but uh, absolutely. This is a game also where, look, I said, you know, ma- ma- mainly looking at Diabate here and, and linebacker. This is a game. I think where you can take Cox out, put Diabate in an edge and let him go rush the passer a, a, a bit more than in the past. Let him go play in a little bit uh, and get some of those other young linebackers spots that Diabate would normally be playing or Bernie would be playing. Ha, you know, Use some of these younger linebackers to force Diabate to go play uh, in his more natural, more comfortable position of rushing the quarterback off the edge. So, yeah, I, I completely agree. Young defensive tackles and get some more playing time as well. But, you know, Bogle, Chatfield, all those guys get into this game, go put up some stats, Princely. Yuma Midland. Let's go see him some more, too. I like what I've seen from him in his limited action. Really excited to go see. I'm probably more excited to see the younger defensive guys, especially the guys on the defensive front there. And also, you know, if Wingo or Hopper get some more playing time, really, really looking at seeing how those guys hold up uh, in, in this type of game here. Uh, Shane Brown says, uh, look, he gets creative and specific here. 60-plus points on offense, 10 or less points on defense. Five sacks, two interceptions, three rushing touchdowns, five trash touchdowns, 400-plus passing yards, 200-plus rushing yards. That'd be a good day. That'd be a good day. There's about 600 total yards of offense right there uh, when you look at it that way. Alexander Alza says, let trash cook, then run the triple option with Jones, Richardson, and Tony for the rest of the game. That might be a, a preview of next year. <laughs> that would be that'd be uh, very, very creative there. Uh, absolutely would be. Would be uh, creative. Levi D says, long touchdown runs by the running back. You guys know my feelings on that, Levi. Uh, I, I just want to see it. Like I said, it's not. And look, guys, don't 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 get on me too hard. Look, am I nitpicking? Look, I'll admit I'm nitpicking. And there's no there's nothing wrong with the offense. It's just 
if there's something else you want to see, if there's another step of this offense you want to see get better, the run game is working. The run game is working. Don't get me wrong. It's not It's not like it's not working. Just get some more explosive there. You can, you can maybe – Trask doesn't need pressure taken off of his shoulders. He can he can he can handle this offense. He can shoulder the load of the offense. But what's wrong with having more help? You know, and, and make defenses prepare for a defense for an offense that can hit explosives in either fashion, run or pass. Put some more pressure on opposing defenses. It's already good enough. You're not going to get much better. But you know, you you you, you never know what you're going to need at some point of a, of a game. Explosive runs from the running backs, the last missing piece. It's not necessary, but it's the last missing piece that I want to see from this offense. Uh, and then pot up with Matthews uh, from Shane Matthews responded. He wants to see 100 points. There we go. Very creative. I want to see 100 points. Let, let, let's go set a record um, uh, out there. For <laughs> look, I don't know how much Florida will, will press the issue once I think your starters are out, but uh, go let those guys play. And then – Kind of going back to, to Shane's days and and, and Spurrier uh, out there. Go let your go let your young guys play. And, and you know Spurrier was like, "Hey, I, I got beat one time, young, in, 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 you know, earlier in my career by not keeping the foot on the pedal." But also, I think it also helps. It helps your young guys. It, it, what fun is it? What learning experience is there? To go out there and just hand the ball off every time you're out there. Okay, your offensive line, your running back gets a whole lot of action. Who else? I mean, these young receivers want to go out there and catch the ball. They want to go play. Run your offense. It's their the opposing defense. Now, there are some sportsmanship involved. I'm not sitting there saying, you know, it, everybody kind of knows what it looks like sometimes. But if, if you don't go out there and run your offense or run your game, it's, it's up to that opposing defense to go stop you. I mean, now two minutes left in the game and it scores 60 to 10 or whatever. Okay, you can call the dogs off then. But if you're up 40 going into the – third quarter midway through the third quarter no you go run your offense there's still plenty of game left you go run it sportsmanship in that fashion to me comes late 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 in the game and you're still out there 16 to nothing and throwing bombs okay you can call the dogs off then but you can get plenty of a playing time third quarter early mid fourth quarter before you got to start calling the dogs off in my opinion that's just how i see it so some people may disagree if you're in the coaching world you may disagree Go out there, play the game as long as possible. It's their job to stop you. All right, let's take a look around the SEC. Everybody, thanks for uh, sending those tweets. Thank you, thank you much. Thanks for all the interaction. Really, 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 really appreciate it here on Gators Breakdown. Saturday, November 21st, here's the SEC schedule. Florida and Vanderbilt, noon at ESPN. Another game at noon. LSU and Arkansas, very, very interesting game. Might be the game of the week in the SEC, uh, honestly, if you want to take a look at these teams here and kind of where they're at. I mean, I believe this was – I saw it. I forget the exact number, but the biggest differential in point spread from year to year. Uh, Arkansas was like a, what, a 40-something point underdog last year, and now they're a one- to two-point favorite. (laughs) So biggest shift from year to year in the history of – uh, college football there, I think is what I saw uh, the, the the tweet there. So big, big, what a difference a year makes <laughs> kind of phrase there that everybody likes. But uh, yeah, Arkansas, LSU, very, very interesting game. Of course, see how that one shakes out. Um, four o'clock on the SEC Network, Kentucky and Alabama. So we get to see Alabama after they didn't get to play uh, LSU last week. Kentucky coming off beating Vanderbilt uh, last week as well. So before the season, I thought this would be maybe a game you could look forward to as far as a, hey, look, um, you're playing a physical Kentucky team, and we didn't really know where Alabama was at before the season started. I knew they'd be really, really good. Uh, but this was still a game I was really looking at, kind of maybe a, a litmus test for both teams. Not so much for Alabama, of course. You expect them to win, but kind of just their style. And you know, I thought Kentucky would be a bit better uh, there. But uh, Kentucky, Alabama, Kentucky is Florida's opponent next week, uh, of course. So a and played Alabama the week before they played Florida. Didn't work out too well for the Gators. Didn't really make that much of a difference. Kentucky's playing Alabama the week before they play Florida uh, this week. So if you want to scout Kentucky a little bit, as soon as Florida and Vanderbilt's over, switch it over to the SEC Network and catch Kentucky and Alabama at 4 o'clock. 7 o'clock, another game I think could be interesting. Tennessee, Auburn. 
two fan bases that are looking squarely at their head coaches here. And a big game for both, I think. Uh, Tennessee, I don't know where that program's heading right now. You know, a couple more weeks before they play Florida. I mean, are, are, how desperate are they to go out there and, and get a victory? I think this is kind of that de- – this is a desperation game here, for I think, for both teams, but more so Tennessee right now. I think that they're looking for something to cling to, and there's not a whole lot out there right now. And in Auburn, this is a game you can't lose. <laughs> I mean – I still don't think they make a move. I was surprised South Carolina even made a move in in the COVID world, but you know, big big money boosters can 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 uh, solve a lot of issues there. It's separate from school school money comes straight. These are coming straight from sports, straight from booster money. So there we go. Uh, but you know, big big uh, storyline I think here for both coaches. Auburn's playing better. Auburn's playing better. Can they continue that? Uh, versus Tennessee this week. So that's another game uh, that I, I'm really looking forward to watching, Auburn and Tennessee. At 7.30 on the SEC Network, Georgia and Mississippi State. I know that game is maybe in flux a little bit. I think we'll get news Thursday, Friday, of how many players will be available for Mississippi State through their final round of testing. I think this is kind of the the word behind the scenes a bit. Uh, that game could be in jeopardy a little bit. But Georgia, JT Daniels will be getting the start for the Bulldogs. They missed a game last week after getting beat by Florida a couple weeks ago. Daniels was probably either going to start or play last week as well. Uh, but now he's done, it's been announced he will get the start versus Mississippi State uh, there for Georgia. So big, big storyline there. I think we'll all, all kind of switch over and, and, and watch that one. I saw the joke out there. Uh, everybody loved falling in love. Everybody fell in love with the Georgia quarterback situation before the season started. So with JT Daniels starting, he's already the Heisman front runner. So <laughs> there, there we go. And then to round out South Carolina's first game without Will Muschamp after firing him this week, 730 SEC Network alternate versus Florida's opponent from last week, or not last week, uh, a couple weeks ago, Missouri. So Missouri at South Carolina, 730. Mike Bobo, interim head coach there for South Carolina. How does that team respond after some opt-outs after Will Muschamp got fired? And how different does how, di- how different do they look? Uh, you know, Missouri is playing better as well. So, you know, we'll see South Carolina home game for them, but we kind of know how those go after a, a coach is fired, plus COVID world. You know, there's not really home field advantage much this this year anyway. Uh, but how does South Carolina respond, I think, to everything that's kind of been going on there this week with the firing of Will Muschamp? So, everybody, all right, that'll do it for this episode of Gators Breakdown. Thanks for listening. A lot, a lot of content out there this week. Uh, we just released the latest edition of the Gator Panel midseason uh, review. A little bit of a look ahead uh, as well with the guys from Stadium and Gale, Dan and Uncle Silk, Corey there. Um, guys from Gator Nation Football Podcast joined us there. Uh, Alan and James. And, of course, Gator, great, tight end, Cornelius Ingram uh, was on there with us. So a lot of good conversation uh, there looking uh, at the Gators from many, many angles. And then, of course, Bill Sykes was on with Will Miles and I this past Monday. So if you haven't listened to that episode yet, go check that out, too. We took a look at Trask and Heisman and how, you know, just how how awesome he's been playing all season and, and looking at him in, in, in a Heisman light and also Bill's research work on how all SEC AP players uh, contribute to winning an SEC championship. So, Really, really good stuff this week on Gators Breakdown. A lot of content to go check out. Thanks for listening to this uh, Vanderbilt episode, preview episode. Chad Bishop hopping on, giving us a really good preview of those Commodores. And that'll do it for this episode of Gators Breakdown. I'm your host, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore S-E-C. Guys and girls out there, thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown.